Hi, how are you? It's Rabbi Wild, and, and I've got to share with you the, the findings of a survey of 5,200 men and women from throughout, primarily North America, but throughout the Orthodox world. Men, women, who define themselves based upon categories. Yeshivish, Hasidish, modern Orthodox, from, from birth, Balei Tshuva, men, women, by age category. 5,200 men and women where we surveyed the quality of marriage in the Orthodox community. And I've got to tell you, the findings were fascinating. The findings were extremely interesting. And we're going to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to share with what does it talk about our marriages, our communities, and what are the challenges that we face as individuals, as communities, in terms of spousal relationships. Well, let's start. And I want to share with you this. The good news is the primary news. Meaning what? When they were asked, well, how would you rate your marriage? 74% of men and 72% of women said, our marriage is either very good or excellent. Now, what does that mean? Wouldn't you like to see 98, 97% saying our marriage is very good or excellent? Well, relative to the average American, asked the same question about status of their marriage. 62.5% of men said their marriage was very good or excellent. 59% of women answered that. So if you compare 62.5 to R74, 59 to R72, relative to society, the news is very good. Yes, we would have loved to see better numbers, but thank God those are very good results. And that's the good news. The other part of the good news he said, I would say about 87%, something like that, 87% of the respondents were married, were not divorcees. And of those respondents, 80% of them said that if they could do it all over again, they would marry the same spouse. I repeat, 80% said if they could do it all over again, they'd marry the same spouse. And that is a very, very good result. That's the good news. But you didn't watch this video to hear the good news. You watch this video to see what the issues are, what the challenges are that we face in our community. And we're going to deal with six challenges that scored very significantly. What does that mean, very significantly? 15% or more of the respondents said, this is an issue, this is a problem, this is a challenge in our marriage. 15% or more. So number six, number five, four, and three all scored between 15 to 20%. Number two and number one scored 22% and 23% of the respondents. That means almost a quarter of the respondents said these were issues in their marriage. So let's, let's, let's begin and let's analyze. The number six issue that was defined significantly as a challenge in orthodox marriages, and I want to make the following caveat. What was fascinating is that those who were divorced responded very similar. The issues that were issues amongst married couples, those were the issues were issues amongst divorcees that broke the marriage. So existentially, it runs across the gamut. The same issues were significant in both groups. Number six, working our way up towards number one, going from least to greatest, David Letterman style. Number six, and that is religious differences. Specifically interesting amongst Bali Chuba can imagine, you know, when they come in, you know, he's diving in, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. She's a little bit uh, fearful. She's got issues. Or maybe sometimes the opposite. She's fast running at full speed, and he has problems. And it affects the quality of marriage in a very significant way. This scored much higher amongst Bali Chuva than those who define themselves as from, from birth. But amongst everyone, this was an issue. Now, why is that? Because when a couple gets married in their 20s, when a couple gets married, they're a young couple. They are not necessarily going to be the same people in 10 years and 20 years. We all grow. As human beings, we're not static. We're not fixed. We're always evolving. We're developing. And what happens? What happens is, is that this became a significant, it was defined as a significant issue. Amongst who? Amongst many of the respondents. Because you know what happens? She became more observant, or he became less observant or they're growing but at different rates. And when the women wrote in specifically comments, because there was an objective answer, you know, where you pushed a certain button, or there's fill in where you could write subjectively, 
He said, you know, he uses the Dafyomi Shir. He uses the Minyan. It's a wonderful that people go to Minyan. We encourage all of our men to daven bit seaboard, to attend Shiur. But when it's used as a crutch, not to help get the kids ready for school in the morning, not to be there at night to help with dinner or to help with homework, then that became very significant. When religion is a kardom lach korba, instead of doing le learning later at night or le doing learning at a different hour, when it coincides with the crucial time where she needs help with the kids, that became an issue. Number five. What was number five? Intimacy. Issues related to intimacy. And what was fascinating here was specifically the comments that came from the women who wrote in when they filled out this survey. See, we're all familiar with the famous dictum of Rebbe Meir, Nida Daf Lamed Aleph, that what? The notion of a period of abstention, that serves as a prelude. It's a setup to the time when the couple can be together. And studies have been done amongst those who observed Taras and Mishpacha, that the experience of the deprivation creating a yearning, a dynamism, creating that, that, that attachment, what happens? Couples observe Taras and Mishpacha, in terms of intimacy, sexually are much more active, 10, 15, 20 years into marriage, and the impact that it has on keeping the marriage fresh and alive. But what many people ignore, or they fail to learn, is what the Moni HaMitzvot say about Taras and Mishpacha, which does not contradict Rebbe Meir, but what it does is it's a compliment. And what is that? that instead of viewing the period of, of abstention as an end in itself, the period of abstention is, I apologize, just the opposite. Instead of viewing the period of abstention as a means to an end, when the couple can be together the rest of the month, it has a role of an end in itself. What do we mean it's an end in itself? Very similar to a Shabbos, to a Shemitah year, to a Yom Tov, that there's a certain time which is designated and set aside for a specific purpose it's designated and set aside for a specific objective. What's that objective? What's that purpose? The objective and purpose is the following. That, for instance, the couple is going to focus on what made this couple a couple. Why did they decide to get married? Yes, there's an attachment, there's a chemical attraction. But the primary focus of the marriage is because it's a meeting of two minds. It's the meeting of two personalities. This couple stimulates each other. This couple complements each other. This couple works together where one plus one equals four, where they're building something greater than themselves. The bias them on Israel. They're building a family. They're building the Jewish people. They're building a destiny, a future. They're contributing to the greater community. And there's a certain time designated for every, every during every month not that there's a carrot at the end of the t uh, tunnel, I'm sorry, the carrot at the end of the stick. That what? He's going to fill up her car with gas, even though she never asked for it. He's going to be helpful. He's going to be warm, loving, nurturing, because he wants something at the end of the evening. He wants to go upstairs at the end of the night. No. Tonight, there's no carrot at the end of the stick. They're going to spend time talking with each other, engaging each other. Why? For the reason that they got married because together they complement each other, because together they build something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And what? There's a certain time every month which is designated just to focus on the intellectual and the emotional slash psychological part of their relationship. That's the purpose of this time of work. That's the goal. Now, what happens? He decides to stay late at work. It's a time to get caught up at work. It's a time to be in the base medrash late, to be learning late, because after all, they can't be together. This is a time, you know, where he's going to spend his time on his fantasy football or fantasy baseball league. So instead of spending time with her in serious, intelligent dialogue, it's a time of being away. And what does she feel like? She feels like an object. You know, well, when I'm good for something, you know, then, then there's warmth, then there's time, then we're together. When, you know, we can't be together in the physical sense, well, I guess you know what? Then I take second seat. I take second seat to everything else in his life, to the business, to the learning, to his, to his hobbies. And she feels used. And she f does not feel loved. And this came across in the comments that were sent in. So number five was issues of intimacy. Number four, more significant than what? 
more significant than religious differences, issues of intimacy, was the issues with in-laws. And we all know the famous joke, what's the difference between outlaws and in-laws? Outlaws are wanted. What does that mean? When it says in the Torah, al yazov ish es aviv ve'imo ve'davak ishto, therefore shall a man leave his, his, his parents, his mother and father, and cling to his wife. It doesn't mean a man alone. It means an individual leaves one's parents, and their primary emotional commitment is to one's spouse. That's the primary emotional commitment. And what happens? What happens is that during that time, kibbut avayim applies. But emotionally, one's primary obligation is to a spouse. And if I'm going to use an analogy, imagine the solar system. The nucleus is the sun. That is the nucleus. What is the nucleus in the nimshal? It's a husband, wife, and their dependent kids. And then there are concentric circles, the planets that rotate or revolve, orbit around the sun. Who are the concentric circles? So parents are the first concentric circle. Siblings are concentric circles. The Jewish community, the local community, the shul, the day school, these are the farther concentric circles. And finally, the greater Jewish people, humanity. But the nucleus is the nuclear family. What happens when someone can't cut the cord? They don't fulfill the dictum that God gave us in Al Yazov Isha Savi Imo Vidavak Bishto. Therefore, shall a person leave one's parents and cling to one's spouse, where the primary emotional commitment is to one's spouse. What happens when someone can't cut the cord? You have two nuclei, and they compete against each other. And whether it is where Pesach is observed, whether it is what's done on vacations, whether it is the, the, the privacy of issues and, and who has a say and who knows about primary issues, it should just be between a husband and a wife. And when that cord is not cut, it creates terrible, terrible damage. And it never allows a couple to grow and to develop into what should be the nucleus, into what should be the primary relationship. Look, it's not easy. You have, specifically in the Persian community, where family is everything. It's the one Yehareg Val What about those who are children of survivors, where it's the only child after the war? And there's a reason that person has four or five Hebrew names because they're named after four or five Kedoshim. And on the burden and the responsibility on the shoulders of that child, who may be 40, 45, 50 years old today, is the continuity, is the legacy of hundreds of years of the family that was annihilated and wiped out, is four or five or six branches of the family with all the children, all the cousins that are gone. And you know, it's not easy for the parents to let go. When they raise that child, it's not just a child, that child is the embodiment of everything that was lost and destroyed. And it's not easy to cut the cord. And it's not easy to, to, to set up boundaries. And I'll tell you something else in our community. Financially, when a couple, sometimes it's a young couple, sometimes it's not such a young couple, when they're financially dependent, whether it's to pay for graduate school, whether it's to pay for the colo lifestyle, whether it's to support whether it's to pay for the kids' tuitions. By definition, when you're dependent upon a father-in-law, dependent upon a father, or a mother, or a mother-in-law, there's a shibud. Psychologically, emotionally, as much as you, they, they could be the most generous, wonderful, hands-off in-laws or hands-off parents, psychologically, you're a dependent. And there's a shibud. And that inhibits and it stifles the ability to function in a healthy way. And we have to be honest about that. And it impinges upon the psychological health, the sense of self-worth. A Jew is dependent upon God and God alone. And when you set up a structure and when you live a lifestyle where you've never made it on your own, you don't have a sense of self, and there's always that shibud, whether it's conscious, whether it's subconscious, that does not allow for the healthiest of marriage. And it doesn't allow for the healthiest of families to develop. And these are the issues. And there's a cost of being orthodox. There's an orthodox tax whether it's the communities we live in, whether it is the smachot. I mean, you, you go to a non-observant or you go to a non-Jewish wedding, 100 people, a big wedding is 120, a huge wedding is 140 or 150. Our weddings, if you don't have 400 people, you don't know anybody. Now, there's a beauty to that. It means we have a sense of community, and we're the richer because we have a sense of community. But there's a cost to that, and bar mitzvah gifts and wedding gifts, and there's a cost to tuitions. It's not, it's, not an, it's not an accident that we have, we, we have blogs like 200K Chump, 
where you have people who are making the top four or five percent of Americans and they can't survive because of the cost of yeshiva tuition. And that, we pay a price for that. And the price for that is being dependent upon parents and others. And this has been a challenge, a serious challenge in our community. Number three, more than the issue of in-laws, more than the issue of intimacy, more than the issue of religious differences. Number three, and you could have guessed this, you didn't need to watch this video to guess this. What is that? Financial stress. The psychologist tells us the following. The human being, and for that matter a marriage, has the amazing ability to come back from, from huge setbacks, from huge attacks on the marriage. We have this great ability as human beings to, to rebound, to bounce back. But you know what a marriage can't su suffer? You know what a, a human being can't suffer? It can't suffer chronic stress. Chronic stress is day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. That chronic stress breaks a marriage. Because it's not something that's a huge attack for a short time, the, the couple has a chance to get back on their feet. It's, it's, it's there all the time. It's persistent. It's chronic. It's constant. And it breaks a marriage. And that was the number three factor. The number three factor. And look, since 2008, we have many observant people who were involved in industries. Those industries are never going to have the kind of jobs, never going to have the kind of employment that existed pre-2008. And they were families that were living above and beyond their means. Not necessarily because they were fine schmeckers, not necessarily because they, they had wrong priorities, but just the cost of living an orthodox lifestyle. And those, the, the, the assumption that they made, the revenues that would be generated, just are not coming in. And it's having a terrible effect, terrible effect. And that's the challenges. We spoke about the orthodox text. We spoke about the challenges. Look, on the one hand, it's the most blessed of all lives. It's the most wonderful of all lives. On the other hand, there's a cost to a life like that. And you know what? I'm not supporting it, and I don't agree with it. But it seems that young couples today, what they view as a need relative to a want, is very different than what our grandparents viewed as a need. Whether it's size of home, whether it's the kind of automobile, whether it's the net of vacations, whether it's the days at work, whether it's other issues. And you know what? Just to survive today, just to keep your job, the kind of hours that are being demanded, the, the kind of families that require both spouses working, things that were not necessary 30, 40 years ago are necessities today, just to survive. So it's not simple, it's not easy, and, it, and it's a challenge. It's a real challenge, and it's considered the third greatest challenge to what? To the quality of our marriages. Number two, and we said, until now, the last four factors came in between 15 and 20 percent. This factor hit at 22 percent of the families, of the respondents. What is that? Time. T-I-M-E, time, the factor of time. Rav Herschel Shechter, the Rosh Kolel from Yeshiva, he always said, why is it in Parshas Mishpatim, when the Torah gives us what? It gives us the obligations that a husband has to a wife. Share, ksus, ona. Ona is, instead of using the typical term, tashmi, shbia, that would be a term for intimacy, ona is the term that's used. What is ona? Ona literally means time. T-I-M-E, time. Why is that the term? Because the responsibility of a husband to his wife, not just when they can be together, but even when they can't be together, it's to be there, to be there for her, to be there with her. It's time. And I'm going to tell you something. The greatest lie that's been perpetrated on Americans over the last half century, and it's an absolute lie, is the lie of quality time. That there's something called quality time that can substitute for quantity time. There's no such thing. You can't substitute for being there. There is no substitute for quantity time. Quality time can add to quantity time. It can add to it. It can supplement it. But God forbid there is no substitute. And look at our work days, and look at our work responsibilities, and look at the, the crackberry, right? We're addicted to these things, the cell phone. It's 24-7. You're expected to respond to business requests 24-7. And what happens? Our relationships are not relationships. 
and we're not there. When we're home, we're not home. We're, we're out to lunch. We're not there. And that's a problem. You know, I'm going to say something that you feel free to disagree with. But I believe our grandparents had superior marriages. As a rule, as a generalization, they had better marriages than we do. And you know, it's interesting. Our sophistication, our knowledge of psychology, our knowledge of the human condition, is far superior to that of what our grandparents knew. Why is it, can I ask you this, why is it they had better marriages? Because they were home, they were there for each other. For those of you who have TV, even if they had a TV, there were three stations, it was off the air at 11 o'clock, there wasn't much to watch. You didn't have 500 channels of cable, you didn't have 24-7 news, 24-7 sports, these things didn't exist. They worked hard, they worked very hard, but when they were home, they were home. When they were home, it was over. They ate dinner together. How often, do, other than Shabbos, how often do we eat as a family? Do we eat together? They were there. They spent time with each other. And there is no substitute for Ona, for time, for I involved Nun Hay. And that's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Because if you're not there for each other, you're not there with each other, there are no substitutes for that. Vis-a-vis -vis children, vis-a-vis -vis spouses. Number one. The greatest factor, 23% said it was an issue, is the issue of communication. See, because when you're there, there's something called communication. And by the way, with these little toys, we've, we've lost the art of communication. We've lost the art of dialogue. IMing and emailing and texting and all the other nonsense, it's not the same thing. It's face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact, body language, being there, developing together. You know, Shabbos, in a Lishma perspective, it's a us testifying to the fact that God created the universe, that the Bore Olam is just that, the Bore Olam. But let's just be selfish for a moment. If it weren't for Shabbos, if it weren't for Shabbos, when would we ever talk to each other as spouses, as a family? When would we ever spend time with each other to discuss issues, challenges, a community to engage each other? to have real relationships. Shabbos is that island in time. It's that savior that saves us, that gives us some sense of normalcy. More than the Jews keep Shabbos, Shabbos keeps the Jews. It keeps us healthy, it keeps us normal. If only we could do live like Shabbos the rest of the week, where there's real meaningful dialogue, there's real meaningful relationships, where we're not slaves to technology, slaves to social media. This is the world we live in, and this is the challenge. And I want to be very specific. The women com complained about the men about not enough communication. There's grunts, you know, you're lucky if you get a yes, a no, a maybe. On a good day, you get a three-word answer. And the men complain about the women. There's too much communication. And I'm going to give you an example. This comes straight out of John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus. You know what the psychologists say about Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus? They say you've got to have that book on your shelf. It's got to be one of the books you have in your home. Not because it's the best psychological work. The reason why, the reason why, not because it's the best psychological work, but why? Because in terms of what it does, you remember what it says. You remember what it teaches. It speaks to people. And when you read that book, you realize what you think is an existential crisis. It's really existentially, it's the nature of men and women. It's not a crisis. It's not unique to your marriage. It's something that we all deal with. But anyways, away from that book, he gives this example. It's called Mr. Fix-It. How does Mr. Fix-It relate to the number one issue, communication? Remember, number six was religious differences, five was intimacy, four was the in-laws, issues with parents meddling, not setting boundaries. Number three was financial stress, financial stress. And number two, we said, was what? Lack of time. But number one, the primary issue is communication. So what happens? He comes home, it's been a rough, tough day, and she is plotting. She is flabbergasted, and she just needs to vent. And she tells him all the issues, what's happened in her life with her job, with the kids, whatever it may be. She needs to unload. And he says, thinking he's doing an amazing thing because he's also stressed. Honey, 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 just, honey, let's sit down. Let's, let, let me explain. And being Mr. Rational, Mr. Logical, with his linear analytical mind, his Talmudic mind, 
he's going to solve her problems. The man that we call Mr. Fixin, he's going to solve rationally and logically all her problems. What he doesn't realize is she's got an IQ 10 points higher than him. If she wanted him to solve his problems, she would have asked him to solve his problems. She just wants him to listen with his body and his speech to communicate that he cares, that he's empathetic, that he's concerned. That's all that she wants. That's all she wants. And they've been through this 10 times, and he's so thick, he doesn't realize that's all she wants. He thinks he needs to go into Mr. Fix-It mode. And she yells at him, will you just be quiet? Will you just listen? Just empathize to show that you care. Don't fix it. If I wanted to solve my problems, I could solve them. I want you to be there for me. Well, you know what? If that's what she wanted, she should have said that from the beginning. She said, honey, she should have started the conversation. I know you're going to want to solve my problems. I know you, you're Mr. Fix-It. Please, honey, just hear me out. Just listen. That's all I'm asking for is just to listen. If she would have said that, then maybe she, he would listen. And he'd hear it. And he'd bite his tongue even though he wants to solve her problems. You know, from a male perspective, we have, we have like an on-off button. We just turn it off. Our complaints were that the women communicate too much. You know, sometimes tafasta maruba lo tafasta. You know, call hamosif goreya. The more you say, the less you say. And what happens is the men just turn it off. So there's a real problem here in communication. Because he's not there. He doesn't communicate. He doesn't share. He doesn't open up. He's not sensitive to her needs. And she communicates too much. Way too much. And there's a disconnect. That came in number one. So again, with all the issues of communication and not enough time and financial stress, and in-laws and intimacy and, and religious differences, with all of those issues, the good news is 80% said if they could do it again, they would do it again. That's the good news. The good news is that what? 74% of men and 72% of women, relative to the rate, general society of 62 and a half and 59, they rated their marriages very good or excellent. Now, it's true, if we would have done a similar survey to religious Catholics or religious Protestants, chances are they also would have scored much higher than average Americans, because marriage is a value. It's a value that's, that's encouraged, that's educated, that's, that, that, that we put, give weight to. So chances are we're not the only ones who scored way above and beyond the average. But nevertheless, it's very good news. What I want to frame is, we have challenges. Modernity has brought, and it doesn't matter if you live in Monroe, if you live in Lakewood, if you live in Teaneck or the Five Towns. Issues of time with each other, issues of communication are universal existential issues. Financial stress transcends the communities. But with all the challenges, with all the hurdles, with all the obstacles that we really have to invest time and energy in these marriages, serious time, much more time than we've invested until now, in, in, in serious energy, towards developing real meaningful communications and setting up boundaries. With all of that being said and done, with all of that being said and done, the good news is very good. The good news is, is that overall, with the challenges, we have a healthy community. We have a community that's working, that's functioning. Yes, we would have loved to see better numbers. And yes, we're going to work towards better numbers. But the numbers are very significant. And they're very positive. And they're very comforting with the challenges. And not denying and not ignoring the challenges, but addressing and engaging those challenges. I want to thank you for listening. And God bless your marriage. And God bless your spouse. And you should be Zoha to continue developing a bias name on the Israel. And if we could end off with the words of the Gom, the Vilna Gom. You know, he asked the basic question. We've all been to chuppahs, we've all been to sheva brachos, and the ultimate bracha is what? The bracha where Chazal give ten synonyms to what this marriage should be. Gila rina ditza v'ched v'ava v'ach v'shalom v'reyus. Of course, I left out sasan v'simcha. Gila rina ditza v'ched v'ava ach v'shalom v'reyus. Chazal were not Shakespeare. They weren't Chaucer. Why ten synonyms? Chazal in general, their methodology is a, a conservation of terms. It's usually an economy of scale. Because what the Gon said, Chazal were saying in this bracha, the petition that we give to the Ribbon Shalom under the Schopa at the beginning of this marriage, is that this couple who today 
their relationship is somewhat superficial. It requires a live band. It requires Sheva Brachas, a new Sheitel, a new suit. It requires all the, the tangible accoutrements to get it off on the right start. But after 10, 20, 30 years of work, this marriage should be zocha to things that you can't accomplish in 10 years. You can't accomplish in 15 or 20 years. Ava. What's Ava? Hey, bathes in Hebrew is to give. It's a relationship where it's all about giving to the other. It's not about being self-centered. It's not about my needs. It's about the spouse. It's about their needs. That's the focus of the marriage. Achva, where there's a kinship, where they become relatives. They become like brothers and sisters. Shalom, from the word shleimus, that they complement each other. They make each other shalem. They make each other whole. But that is what they do for each other. And ultimately, reus, they become the best of friends. You don't make each other complete and whole. You don't become the best of friends overnight. It takes years and years of time, years and years of communication, years and years of energy and commitment. That's the brach. And let's be honest, most marriages, which do not end in divorce, most of our marriages don't end in divorce, but most marriages don't attain necessarily ava, achva, b'shalom t'reus. What was the Gon teaching us? What was the Vilna Gon teaching us? The brach chazal formulated that we give and that we ask the chassan and kala to always remember throughout their marriage is that they should have the ability to work, the energy to work, the time commitment to work, to attain those great, great levels that transform the marriage from being a marriage into something profound, that transform the marriage into being something great and superior, that they attain the levels of ava v'yachva v'shalom v'reis. Thank you. God bless the Jewish people. God bless Bayes Nehman be Israel and the Abish that should bless our communities. Thank you very much.